joining the call today. I'm happy to, uh, to get to speak with you and I appreciate your time. Um, looking forward to sharing some of, our, some of our practices and thoughts on open source licensing. Um, <clears throat> so I think for the, for the talk today, we're gonna start with um, looking from the licensing side, talking about what open source means in that context. So starting with a broad look at it, um, starting with a kind of broad and informal definition, and then narrowing, narrowing down from that to looking at some of the specific definitions that are out there from some organizations around what open source or other similar terms mean. From there, we'll then talk about some of the underlying uh, legal mechanisms such as copyrights and patents that drive the, the way that open source licenses work in practice. Uh, we'll then take a closer look at some of the different types of open source licenses and ways of categorizing to think about them. Uh, we'll look at the, uh, moving then from the substance of the licenses, we'll look at some ways that, uh, that you, when using them, you can uh, more easily manage open source license information in your projects and in your code. And then finally, we'll talk briefly at the end about uh, the ways that license concepts work in contributing to open source projects. Uh, and throughout this, at the, uh, at the end of the slides, we'll be, we'll be making the slides available after the call. Uh, there's a number of resources at the end that are that'll be of of use to you. Um, and if we have time after the Q and A, I'll go through and uh, and uh, touch on some of those resources. So let's see. With that, we'll go forward. Um, <clears throat> so feel free to uh, to contact me after this as well if you have if you have questions or if you want to uh, want to follow up on anything. Um, I should note here, I, uh, <laughs> kind of the obligatory statement, I, uh, I am a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer, uh, so I'm not able to give you legal advice. So what we'll be talking about today are general, think of them as general community understandings of these concepts. Um, if you're looking for legal advice, you'll want to look at the, if you want to understand how a particular license works in the, your particular case, you'll, you'll want to talk to your own uh, legal counsel about that. So here we go. Um, so when we're talking about licensing, what does open source mean? Um, and you know, when we talk about open source broadly away from the legal and the licensing context, it can mean a lot of things. But what I wanna do is try to narrow down on a specific meaning of this that you've probably seen elsewhere if you've looked at open source in the licensing context before. So um, you know, informally, we might think of open source as being, some people may think of it as being just software that you can download for free, something like shareware or freeware. Um, or people might, might uh, incorrectly think of it as being source code that you can download for free. If the source code is available, does that mean that it's open source, if you can just get access to the source code? Or if the source code is available and you can contribute back to it, if there's a, a project, if there's a community that people can take the code, change it, contribute it back to, does that make it open source? And what I wanna focus on for this call is that it, for purposes of talking about open source, what we really want to focus on it being software is open source if the source code is available under an open source license. That might sound circular, but um, you know, it leads to the question, okay, what is an open source license? And as I said, we'll, get to, we'll look at some of the formal definitions a bit further down the call, but um, we'll start with a broad kind of informal look at what an open source license means. And so I want to, I want to do this broadly to help you um, kind of get a sense for what, for what an open source license means. And so informally, what it, these are, what I would say are kind of some of the key traits of something being an open source license. The first is, it's a set of legal terms. So a license is a legal document that's granting rights. And so it can be as short as one sentence, it can be multiple pages long, but it's a set of legal terms. And those terms grant broad rights to use, modify, and distribute software. Um, they grant those rights for both source code and for binary or object code form of the software. And that's something that, you know, the, the context in which some of these licenses were made, in some cases assumed that there was a distinction between source form and binary form. In some programming languages, in some ecosystems, there, that might not necessarily apply as a difference. But for, the, we'll, for, for these purposes, we'll assume there is that distinction between source code and binary code, um, or the, the binary being the compiled source code. 
these licenses or open source licenses are typically written for use with any type of software. So not typically not uh, focused on a particular type of technology. And they're typically standardized to an extent. There's um, a, a specific set of terms that make up the license. And there's generally speaking, there's, there's a, you'll run into hundreds of different licenses out there if you're looking in kind of all the pointer cases, but there's a small set of the most commonly used licenses. And these are typically standardized. So this is unlike proprietary software where proprietary software, often you'll have a different end user license agreement for every product or for every service that you're getting. For open source licenses, there's a small set of the most commonly used licenses that generally speaking will stay the same from case to case. So, um, and the key part of all of this is that they typically impose responsibilities or conditions on redistributing the software on using the software. They do not typically impose restrictions on using it. So they'll say essentially, if you redistribute, then you must do the following. And for certain permitted things that are of those conditions, but they won't typically say, you may not redistribute the software or you may not use the software. If it said something like that, almost certainly it would not be an open source license. Um, so let's look in at a, at a specific example. So we'll go with the MIT license, which is one that if you've looked at licenses before, you've almost certainly run into. Um, and this is, and it's also, you know, helpfully, it's one of the shortest open source licenses that's in common use. So it's one that even, you know, that you can look at and get a pretty easy grasp around what it's, what it's saying. So the MIT license, it's three paragraphs. They're very short. It's less than probably about half a page if you were to print it out. Um, but what I've done here is to emphasize, to bold and highlight a few of the, the key phrases of it. So looking at the first paragraph, it says, permission is hereby granted. So this is a granting of rights. It's a granting of legal rights to deal in the software without restriction. So granting permission to deal in software without restriction. There's then examples of what that means, including without limitation, a series of other things. But kind of those are sub, those are uh, given as examples in the, of subsets of dealing in the software without restriction. So that's the license grant. And then at the end here, sorry for the highlighting, uh, at the end here, subject to the following conditions. So what are the conditions? The conditions are the above copyright notice, so the copyright notice at the top, and this permission notice, this license, shall be included in all copies or substantial portions of the software. So the rights that are granted are this broad set of rights to deal in the software without restriction. The condition, the responsibility is to include and reproduce these notices. And that's it. This does not put forward a restriction on software. It's a, or a restriction on what you can do. It says you can do, you can deal in the software without restriction. And then at the bottom of the license, there's a, uh, the you know, lawyer's uh, paragraph of all caps legalese. Uh, I'm not going to go through that in this in this example, but um, that's where you find disclaimers of warranty and liability and that sort of thing. So those make up part of the license. I won't talk about them here, but this in, this in its whole is the MIT license. And so this is um, something that even not as a lawyer, you, you know, you'll want to talk to your, your legal counsel for discussing how, what this means in, in your context. But just to get a sense of what it does, this is something you can understand pretty easily just by looking at it. Steve? There is a question about um, of, are there any license uh, checkers uh, tools available? Um, is this something you're going to cover later? Do you want to feel that? Question? It is, yes. That's a okay. great question. And that is something that we'll definitely turn to later. We'll talk about it in kind of big picture. And then at the end of the slides and the resources, I've got links to a number of open source tools that are out there that can, can help, that do exactly this, that help you find licenses in your in your source code or independencies that you're using so that you can so that you know what's there so that you can address it appropriately yep we'll definitely turn to that later are there any other questions at this point just that one okay great so then going on um so that so up till now i've been talking with a pretty informal definition of what open source licenses mean um, there are two, the, the Open Source Initiative and the Free Software Foundation have both put out um, kind of well-established definitions of what they mean by open source in the first case and free software in the second case. So 
in the case of, of open source initiative, OSI, um, they, they are the stewards of the open source definition, which is a 10 point, essentially a 10 point checklist of a license has to meet these 10, these 10 requirements in order for it to be considered an open source license. So the informal definition that I talked about earlier, it, it didn't get into all, you know, it, I didn't get into all the details of what this includes. Um, but the, it, they have both their list of the 10 points that they use to define what is an open, what they'll approve as an open source license. And then at the link that I've included here, uh, they include annotations which explain in some more detail each of those 10 points. For the open source initiative, there's a, a license review mailing list. So they have an open process for how they, uh, how they take submissions for new licenses to be considered and evaluated by the community. And then wh whether or not they're approved by OSI. Um, to make that determination whether a license meets those requirements and that they'll approve it as an open source license. So in the case of the Free Software Foundation, they have the, the, what they define as the four essential freedoms for something to be considered free software. Um, and so those, those are essentially, it's their four points of what they say, how they look at licenses. And so just in a nutshell, it's that they, they require that, uh, that the software can be run by, run for any purpose, that it can be studied and changed, uh, that it can be redistributed and that you can redistribute the changes that you've made to it. So again, I'm summarizing, that's just in a nutshell, but that's what the FSF uses to define something as free software and the way that they look at licenses. So these are two different, I wouldn't say that these are opposites by any means. I think these are two different lenses through which different folks evaluate licenses and think about them. Um, and in most cases, and certainly for any of the regular cases that you're going to typically encounter in practice, virtually all open source licenses and virtually all, all there's going to be overlap between for the most common licenses that they will be considered open source and free software if they're one or the other. So, um, okay, so then with all that as the background, let's get into a little bit of the legal underpinnings of all of this. So we've talked about licenses. We've talked about the fact that licenses grant rights. So what's the basis for someone being able to grant these rights? Um, and what it is, is there's a couple of different, different uh, legal concepts that are established in national laws. And these are, these are gonna, they differ from country to country. There's some harmonization of them across, there's a lot of harmonization of them across countries because of treaties that have been established. But um, I'm gonna be talking primarily from the US perspective, just because that's, that's what I know. Um, but we'll look at copyrights and patents primarily, and then we'll turn to a couple of other things. So copyrights are the key one, the key legal concept that drives um, the primary way that open source licenses work. And so a copyright is something that's a legal right to control an original creative work that you've created. Um, and here creative work is, uh, you know, this can, this or originally when copyright was created, this would have been centuries ago, so it was more in the context of written, of, uh, you know, books, uh, published materials in that sense, um, art that was created, those, those sorts of things. Um, it, it's understood that copyright ex extends to software. Software in the U.S. is seen as being a literary work. Um, it's included in that category because it's a, because it can be written out the same way that a book or a, a written work can. Um, and so these, these legal rights in the U.S., the owner of a copyright uh, has the exclusive right to do a number of things. And those exclusive rights include that that copyright owner has the, is the only person by default under the copyright laws who has the right to copy the work, to re reproduce it, to prepare derivative works based on it. So to modify it or, you know, we could, we could spend an entire separate session on what exactly derivative, preparing derivative works means. But, for these purposes, think of it as modifying or incorporating the work into other things. Um, distributing copies of, of the work or publicly performing, publicly dis displaying it. So by default in the US, and this is a key part of it too, when you create a, a written, when you create a work, when you create software that is created, that kind of meets the minimal, the, the minimal threshold of being creative and you fix it in a tangible medium, when you do that, you or depending on the context, you or your employer owns, automatically owns a copyright in that work. So you don't have to register it. There is registration. You can, someone can register their work with the copyright office. That's kind of a separate concept, but just by fixing it in a tangible medium, 
the, the creator of it now owns the copyrighted. And that's, that's really the, the fact that that automatically happens is really the reason why it's important to care about open source licenses because in the US, the law is going to say that once you've created something, you now are the, ex the, the, the owner of the exclusive right to do these different things. So if you take code that you've written and just put it, up, put it up on GitHub, put it up somewhere for people to access and don't grant them a license, don't say anything about the license to it, the, everybody else doesn't know whether they actually have any rights to use it, um, to, to use it, to copy it, to change it, to do anything. So by putting an open source license on open source work that you create, it lets the community know, yes, I am officially saying you can do these things. I'm giving you permission to do these things. Um, so I see there, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Let me, let me look at those quickly. Um, so I see there's, there's a question about, um, so we talked, okay, we talked about the, uh, we'll come back to the, uh, the frameworks for checking licenses. Um, the, there's a, okay, then there's a question about um, comments that if you don't have the, I, th I think the question here is if you don't have a year on a copyright notice, if you don't have a copyright notice with the C in a circle, or if you don't kind of go through these particular formalities, does that mean that it's not a copyright? And so that, that's, um, yes, if a, to have a copyright in, in a work that you've created, you do not need to go through those formalities of, create, of putting a notice on it in any particular form. So it used to be the case in the US several decades ago, it used to be the case that in order to have a copyright, you would need to go through, certain, you'd need to include certain formalities. You might need to include the word copyright or include a C in a circle or include a notice in a particular format. That's been changed. So, current, so under current law, to own a copyright in something, you don't need to go through any of those formalities. You, um, just by creating it and fixing it in a in tangible medium, you now own the copyright in it. Um, the, the, there are, we've, we've, put, we've put out at the LF, we've put out some recommendations to projects because we get these questions all the time about um, what is, should I be updating the year on my copyright? Should I be doing certain other thing? A uh, year on my copyright notice, should I be doing it in this particular format? We've put out some, uh, some, what we recommend as best practices for how open source projects can handle this. Um, in the resources at the end of at the end of the slide deck, there's a, I've got a link to a blog post where we've put out these practices. So I'll 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 go to that afterwards, um, and we can we can look at that in a little more detail. So, um, but here for for so copyright because of that automatic creation and automatically applying to, in most cases, creative uh, creative level of software that's uh, that's fixed and and made available. Um, it's because that copyright and there's exclusive rights automatically apply. That's why there's, it, it's important to put, a light, put an open source license on work that you're publishing for, with the intent of other people being able to use it and copy it and exercise their rights under open source concepts. Uh, and I'll, I'll look at one more question. So there's a question also for, for an open source project with multiple creators whose copyright and country apply. Fantastic question. Um, also going to be something that is, is a complex, um, fairly complex case by case basis. But most projects, most projects that I'm aware of will look at it as <clears throat> each contributor owns, the cop owns a copyright in their contributions to it. So the original, the original work would have, um, the original work would have the Copyright, the copyright would be owned by the original creator. Other people who contribute patches to it or changes to it or additions own a copyright in their contributions to it. So I see there's, there's a question. Can you unmute to ask a question? Sure, let's, we'll go ahead and take one more question and then, then I'll, I'll move on and we can come back to, to other questions afterwards. But yeah, if you wanna go ahead and unmute. Um, I'm not, you may be, you may still be on mute. I'm not hearing a question if there is one. Uh, hi, Steve. Hello, welcome. Yes, uh, my name is Gilshan Ustroker. Uh, I'm from uh, Suriname. Uh, it's a, con a small country in uh, South America. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so in my country, we do not have uh, 
we do not have ro a, a law for royalties and for things for things like copyrights but if i do want to put a copyright on something i created how can i still do that yeah it's it, it's a it's a great question and i this is <laughs> this is the sort of thing where i to be very upfront that I be, I'm, you know, I'm a US based lawyer, both since I'm, you know, since I can't provide you legal advice, but also because I, I, to be honest, don't know about the legal, the legal system in your, in your country, I really wouldn't be able to tell you what is, you know, what's permitted, what the process would be and whether there are, you know, certain formalities you need to go through. Um, so yeah, I, I apologize that that's really something that I just don't, I don't, I don't have either the expertise or really the, uh, what, <laughs> the ability to be an uh, advisor. Uh, but do you think that maybe if I, say uh create my stuff and um i don't know let let it be copyright in, in in another country or in the the region of my of 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 where my country is like by, uh, like um i'm from south america and maybe our region is uh south america and you have north america maybe there's some kind of region i can still copyright my stuff yeah, I think you, I think you'd really you'd really need to look at your own local your own local laws and either talk you know fi find an find an attorney there to talk to or take a look at the the laws that would apply for your country yourself. I really just unfortunately I don't I don't have the ability to know to be able to tell you um, you know whether it's something that you could do, you could you know in your case shift to a different country somehow or how that would work. Uh, one thing you could do, one thing you could do would be to you know if there are other open source projects that have come out that you're aware of that have come out of your your country you know you could look at what their practices have been just to get a sense for how other people may have approached this so okay great. steve thank you thank you all right so then going on um so we've talked about copyright as an overview let's turn to we'll talk briefly about patents as well so um so where copyright applied to legal rights to control a a specific creative work, so a specific program that you've written. For patents, it applies to control an invention, so essentially to control the uh, a concept that somebody has taken and built and embodied. And in the U.S., um, again, there's a set of exclusive rights that the owner of a patent has, and the owner of a patent has the ability, they're, they're the exclusive ones who can make the invention, who can use it, who can sell it or offer it for sale or who can import it into the US. Um, and again, this is a summary. There's many, many more complications here we could get into, but um, there's a couple differences between, excuse me, between patents and copyrights. One of the key ones is that patents do not automatically exist. Just the fact that you, you know, like what we talked about for copyrights, the way that a, a, a copyright would be, um, would automatically exist from fixing it in from fixing it in tangible work for an in, for an invention you don't automatically have a patent just by inventing something what you have to do is you go to the patent and the in the us it's the patent and trademark office you apply and you have to demonstrate to the, the patent and trademark office that your invention is useful that it's novel it's something new and that it's non-obvious that it wouldn't have been obvious to anybody based on what already existed and there's a lot more we could you know again Kind of entirely separate talk on uh, how those concepts apply in practice, but the key thing here is that um, patents do not exist just by the fact of somebody creating something. You have to, the, a patent holder would have to go and actually apply for it and take these steps to get a patent. So, um, because because of the way that uh, that the patent laws of or and the way that they're interpreted in the U.S. have evolved over time. Patent considerations are something that open source, that users of software of any sort, open source or not, any sort of, of uh, developer of software may, may be considering what patents, uh, whether patents apply. And for, for today's purposes, what I'm going to talk about primarily is around how this applies to open source licenses. So in, when you look at an open source license, we talked about the fact that it'll um, that it will uh, that's focused around copyright around granting copyright rights. In addition to that, most licenses will, in some way, talk about rights that may overlap with patent rights. So, um, in some cases, such as the Apache Two license, they, it talks very explicitly about copyrights and patents. It says the the Apache Two Point Zero license has a a section that talks specifically here are the rights that are being granted under essentially under copyrights. And then another section of here are the rights that are being granted under patents. 
Other licenses might not be as clear about this. They might not explicitly use the word patent when they're talking about what they're granting. And so there's some, there's you know, differences of, of opinion, differences of views around how certain licenses might apply to copyrights versus patents. But um, I'm gonna go ahead a couple of slides. I'll come back in a second. But for instance, when you're looking at the MIT license, if you remember, when we go back, we go back to look at that, we had that section in there that said to deal in the software without restriction and then listed out examples. So including without limitation, listed out examples of some of these rights. And when you look at these examples, you'll see, you know, here, the way that the MIT license is set up, it's not as explicit about which rights are patent versus copyright versus whatever. Some of the words that are in here are more copyright focused. So copy or distribute are the sort of, the sort of words you'll find in, in the US that you'll find in copyright law. Other words like using or selling sound more like patent terms. And then there's other in here, others in here that don't, that don't really show up in, those, in the laws at all. So something like merge is more of a term that you'll find in, you know, in practice in software development, but it's not something that the copyright or trademark laws use that term to talk about. So the way that you look at the MIT license and think about how it applies to copyrights or patents may be different from the way that you would look at a license like Apache, where they're very explicit about those two, those two different concepts. Steve, there are a few questions. Do you want to field them now or later? Um, let me see. So there's a question about where's the line between an invention and, I, and an idea for being recognizable being a patent? Um, <laughs> that, another excellent question. Um, that is something that, uh, that we could, again, spend a whole lot of time talking about. And I think for, for purposes of this call, I'm probably not going to get into detail about that because that's really, that's really focused more on how someone, at what point someone would be able to go and apply for a patent. In, it's going to vary by country. In the U.S., typically some aspect of it is going to be able to, is going to be uh, it, being able to demonstrate both those things that I mentioned before. So it being a, a novel invention, something that's useful, something that's not obvious. Um, separately, there's typically going to be some aspect of being able to show that you've reduced it to practice, that you've actually built it, that it's not something that's just kind of a, an abstract concept or an abstract idea. Um, there's other other pieces like that. So it's a you know, like, unfortunately, like many things, I'm going to I'm going to be saying it's it's a complicated thing. Um, but yeah, that's it's there's a lot of pieces that go into it. So it's not something that the, the main takeaway I'd say is it's definitely not something that's going to be as automatic as creating uh, as having owning a copyright in a work that you've created. Um, um, I see that. Steve, yeah, yes. So, so sorry. Um, so we have um, one question that came through the chat, and then one attendee that would like to unmute and ask a question. Which one would you like to take first? Uh, let me just, there's a couple in the chat. Let me just take a couple, um, a couple things here quickly in the chat and then we'll go to, we'll go to unmute. Um, so there's one I see here from earlier, I think about what does tangible medium mean? So this was in the copyright context. Um, so this is, the, this is the wording that's used in the law. It's gonna, again, it's gonna be different in different contexts because um, you remember, if you remember the copyright laws are written not just for software, but for you know, kind of essentially any sort of creative works. So, when we're talking about written works like books, it, it would be it would be the book itself, um, or or essentially writing it down, writing something on paper, fixing it on paper. That paper is the tangible medium. So, it, it, typically, you can think of it as something that exists that can be perceived and that that is not just you know sitting in your head. Um, in the case of software, I would say generally, you know, I think you'd see it as when you're. You know, I, don't want to get too far into details here, but when you, if you're saving something to a hard drive, if you're making it available online, um, you know, from something like a GitHub site, things like that, I think those are typically going to be seen, I would expect, as it being fixed in the tangible medium of existing on the hard drive. So, so there is a question, Steve, about uh, making changes to the Linux distro. Uh, I can read that out to you. If I make changes to a Linux distro, will I be bounded by the licensing issues for redistribution? Or can I redistribute my version of the Linux distro to multiple users? So, so what I'd say there, so the, 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 the Linux kernel is under the GPL2 license. And so in looking at what you're permitted to do there, the starting point would be to look at the, look at the GPL um, and specifically the GPL version two. There's multiple different versions of the GPL and for, for the Linux kernel, it's GPL2. Um, so when you look at the GPL, the, the Free Software Foundation as the stewards of that license, they've written a number of things about that license and uh, 
what it means. And so they have a lot of guides that help that can help people understand not just the kind of the the not just looking at the legal wording of it, but also how how you can use it in practice and what rights it gives you. And so if you mentioned, if you remember earlier, I talked about the, the different four essential freedoms that the FSF talks about. So the freedom to run the program, to study and change it, to be able to just redistribute it and your changes. The FSF, has, you know, they, as the authors of the GPL, they've made it clear that they, that they view the GPL as embodying those freedoms. And so I think certainly, certainly you can look at it and say, yes, it permits you to do those things. What you would need to look at and what you need to look at in the context of your specific case and working with your legal counsel usually would be um, what are the obligations that go along with that. So I'll come back to that later in the talk when we talk about some of the different types of open source licenses. But really that's, that's the key thing is that the license, you know, speaking broadly, the license, licenses that are open source licenses or free software licenses don't say you may not X. They say you may X, you may do whatever, but in for certain things there are these obligations or responsibilities that go along with it, and so we'll we'll turn to those a little bit more later on. Um, I see there's one more question in the chat. Let me um, let me look at this, and then I think there was one more to come off mute. So we'll we'll look at these two, and then I'll I'll go on, and then we may come back to the Q and A further at the end. Um, so there's a question in the chat about uh, if the if I could address the patent troll problem. As it relates to trolls being able to take us take advantage of open source projects that are not Apache too. So I see that's that's the question in the chat. So what I what I'd say there, what I think that's referring to is, um, so as I said before, some licenses, Apache two being one of them. There's many more, but Apache two is one of the licenses that talks about that has specific language around saying first, here is a copyright grant under my as the contributor under my copyrights. I'm granting you these these rights. Then second, there's a there's a uh, a section that talks about patent licenses. So it says, as a contributor to this project, under my patents, if I had any patents, I might not. But if I did, I'd be granting you licenses under those patents within the scope of what it describes. And so, um, in a lot of cases, people who are concerned about patents might prefer using software that's under a license like Apache Two. And there are many others. There's many. There's um, some of the the weak and strong copyleft licenses that we'll talk about later, such as GPL three. Some of the others um, have sections that make this distinction that talk explicitly about copyrights and patents. And so people who are using may, some people who are concerned about patents might feel more comfortable using software that's under those licenses because it explicitly says that the contributor of code to that project is granting licenses under any patents that they may have regarding their contribution. So that may help, may help remove some concerns that people might have about if I'm using software under, under one of these licenses, I know, you know explicitly they've said I'm getting a patent license. For other cases where other licenses that might not be as explicit, the question would be to what extent are patents owned by the, by the contributor being licensed under that license? And I'll say I think it's an open-ended question. I think that there's you'll you'll find disagreements about it for a, any particular license um, kind of across the community. So I'm not gonna I, I'm not going to kind of get into specifically which licenses say this or that and what and what they mean. But that's kind of the framing of it is that um, with regards to contributions to a project, looking at the license, what's the scope of the license and does it encompass copyrights as well as patent rights? Right. So that patent rights and patent licenses. So I think there was one more there. You'd mentioned there was one question, someone who wanted to come off mute, if you want to go ahead and ask that. Yes, I believe uh, the attendee's name was Mert. I'm, I'm sure I'm not, may not be pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Hi, Mert. Welcome. I see, I see the comment in the chat. If you want to come off mute and go ahead and ask a question. Thanks for the presentation. And happy new year. Uh, I'm uh, living in Turkey, uh, but uh, volunteering to uh, some foundations uh, like Free Software Foundation, FreeBSD Foundation, um, in some sense, not directly. Uh, so I want to volunteer for the Linux Foundation too. Uh, I work with a project uh, called Layer 5. Uh, I volunteer maybe it's uh, more native in your language. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, 
when we uh, have meetings with Free Software Foundation, we have a we have an application called Scan Code Scan Code Toolkit. Do you know that? I, yes, I do. I do know scan code, and that is one of when we get to the uh, to the end of the presentation in the or, or towards the end when I'm talking about managing license information, I, I will talk about scan code and 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 some of the other things that are out there. Sure. Uh, my question is, in short, I am in I am into I'm keen to learn uh, artificial intelligence for legal issues for both uh, security issues uh, like physical security or cyber security and licensing. Uh, in short, in other words, uh, I want to make a software and a framework or make existing better uh, uh, and then Linux Foundation may use it or not. Uh, but it is not about me. Uh, we need a uh, better solution rather than uh, the existing one. Um, I don't want to make a hate speech, or hate speech of course, but uh, I'm. I do research for that. Uh, I, I want to tell you about that. Great. So, so thank you. So that's 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 really interesting. That's great to hear. So I think what I, what, what I'm. Saying, what is your opinion? In other uh, words, my question. What is your opinion? What should we do for licensing software? Sure. Yeah. So so a couple of things. So I'll get into some of the some more of the details further along towards the end of this talk. Um, and and in the resources at the end of the slides, I've got some other, some other comments on that. But um, so I, I will get into talking about some of the details of what we're doing and some, some Linux Foundation and other projects that, that are looking at this. Um, specifically with what you're talking about for using, for instance, artificial intelligence to help supplement the ability to search for code, search code and look for licenses. Um, part of that, I, I, I know, I believe within, so Fossology is one, one project for, that can be used to scan for open source licenses. And I believe there's some work they've been doing in the past year or so to, you know, they have a number of different strategies, different agents that can be used to search code for license information. I believe there's one that is looking at using some artificial intelligence concepts for that. So that could be a place if you're, if you're interested in, in participating and getting involved, that could be a place to look at. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to some other parts of it as we get towards the, the later part of the talk. I just want to make sure that we, um, I'm, I'm kind of setting the context for the, uh, describing the, the considerations for open source licenses. And then I think we'll turn to some of the, the more practicalities of how you manage that information afterwards. So, great. Thanks. Okay, then uh, talk to you later. Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we're going to keep, I think we're going to keep going. Um, so we've talked about copyrights and patents. Um, I'm going to just briefly touch on a couple other, a couple other legal concepts. Um, so, and we're, we're not going to spend much time on either of these, and you'll, you'll see why. But so for, uh, in addition to copyrights and patents, another additional kind of legal framework for rights are trademarks. And so trademarks are, are the legal rights to control a mark. So it's a mark being a brand, a name, or a logo that the purpose of it being to designate the origin of goods or services, so to say, where these, <clears throat> these goods, this software, these services come from. To do that, you know, people, organizations associate their name or their logo, their brand, with those goods. And in the U.S., there, and in, in most countries, there's going to be some rights that are given to owners of a mark to be able to protect that mark and to be able to use it in connection with the goods and services they're offering. So in the US, you can kind of, similar to some of the others, you can apply to register a trademark with the Patent and Trademark Office. In the US, something that is different from a lot of other countries, you can also get some unregistered trademark rights just from using the trademark. So just by going out there and using your mark, you can accrue some, some they're sometimes called common law rights in the trademark. Um, one thing about trademarks is that they're not typically seen as being explicitly included in most open source license grants beyond certain circumstances. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it. So even though you're having the right to use, you know, to use software, to copy it, to redistribute it, to do all these things, that doesn't, if it's open source software, even though you're allowed to do these things, that doesn't necessarily extend to you can then declare yourself to be the project itself, to be the source of the project. There's kind of that distinction between the project using a trademark to say, this is who we as the community are um, and people participating in that community, but 
preventing, but not having organizations or individuals kind of being able to declare themselves to, to use that trademark to declare themselves um, kind of the owners of that trademark for other purposes. So it's a complicated topic. We won't get into it in kind of more detail here, but just want to raise that as sometimes questions come up about how do trademark, how are trademarks addressed in open source licenses? And again, there's a range. Some licenses will talk about them explicitly, others won't. But it's something you'll want to, if you're, if you have questions about this in a particular case, you'll want to look at the particular license and see whether and how it talks about trademarks. And then finally, there's one kind of if you uh, if you go to a lawyer who is not uh, kind of not open source focused and ask them what the you know sometimes they'll use the heading of intellectual property to co to cover a bunch of these different concepts. Um, you know, with, kind of without getting into debates about what that term means, if you ask someone who isn't associated with open source, they'll often include something like trade secrets or confidential information in the bucket of things that are loosely thought of as intellectual property. And here, you know, trade secrets in, again, in the US are primarily thought of as legal rights to control information that the <clears throat> owner takes some measures to keep secret and where that information has value from not being generally known. And the reason we're not really getting into this here is because it's basically the opposite of open source. Open source, you're taking, you're taking, you know, someone who's contributing to open source is willingly making everything available, making it public and making it available for people to use under the, under the open source license. And so, you know, trade secrets are really kind of the opposite of that. Trade secrets are keeping everything back for just to use for yourself. So we won't get into that in further detail here, just raising this to mention, if you're looking at an open source project and you're looking at the notices in it and you see something where a contributor, or if you are contributing, if you see a, a, something that says in open source code that purports to have it be confidential um, or something similar to that, that may be a signal that somebody has done, somebody uh, has probably either mistaken some notices or contributed something they shouldn't have for in, in the project. So typically, if everything is what it should be, you shouldn't be seeing confidentiality notices in, in a project. And <coughs> so we talked about the, uh, looked at the MIT license in light of these concepts already. So we'll go on from there. Um, so I see there's a, quickly, there's a, a question in the chat about what do you need to do to defend a trademark? Um, if we have time at the end, I'll come back to that. That is something that is, I think it is kind of outside the scope of what I want to focus on, on here. So I do want to keep going for now, but we, we may come back to that afterwards if we have time. So thanks. Um, okay, so then moving onwards. So we've spent quite a bit of time. We've talked about kind of building up the framework for how, what open source licenses are, what are the legal mechanisms in, uh, in law that they're built on top of. So now let's look at what some of the broad categories of different types of open source licenses are. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna present this again, just both informally and from one perspective. So this is another thing where if you ask, if you ask five people or ask five lawyers, um, you'll get 10 different opinions on how to, uh, how to think about this. So um, what I'm gonna present is just one way of, of, for someone who's new to open source licensing, one way to, to think about them and look at, at categorizing them. So, here, what I would say is think about it on a spectrum of obligations or responsibilities. So again, we talked about at the beginning, open source licenses will let you do essentially anything um, with certain responsibilities attached to some of those actions. So we'll look at licenses that are on the lesser side of fewer obligations, and then licenses that are on the, we'll say, greater side of more obligations. And this is what, so kind of this framework is one way that you can approach thinking about these licenses. So on this spectrum, one kind of broad bucket of licenses are those that are typically called permissive. You'll sometimes hear these called attribution licenses, something like that. I think permissive is probably a better term. Um, for permissive licenses, what this really means, the main responsibility here is that if you are, if you are getting software from someone under a permissive license, then your main responsibility around that, you know, each license will have different wording, but the main in responsibility is that when you redistribute the software to somebody else, you should also be providing its license and its copyright notices along with it. So like, so MIT license is a perfect example of this. That's where we looked at the scope of licenses in that first paragraph with the responsibilities in the second paragraph boiling down to, you have to retain the, the license and the copyright notices. 
So these are called permissive licenses. On the other end of the spectrum, for those that have greater obligations attached with them, would be those that you might see described as copyleft or strong copyleft. And here, on the, again, on this spectrum, here, the, the main responsibility for these, again, complicated and you want to look at them in detail, but the main responsibility boils down to if you're taking copyleft software that you got from somebody else, if you're taking it and redistributing it, you should also be providing the same freedoms and their same rights to downstream recipients. So the way this is seen is from projects that are using strong copyleft licenses, the intent is you as the recipient of software from them, you're getting the benefits of all of these broad freedoms and rights that they are granting to you. So in exchange, when you're then redistributing that software to someone else, you should also be providing to your downstream recipients the same sets of freedoms and rights that you received. So here, this is where a strong copyleft licenses would typically say, you know, when you are taking and creating a derivative work or a work based on, or there's different terms used here, but a, a work that's based on the strong copyleft work that you got, then you should also be provide, may, providing or making available to your downstream recipients the source code to your own software or your own modifications to it along and you should be providing that source code under the same strong copyleft license. So that enables downstream recipients of it to continue to exercise the same rights that you would receive. So to be able to take it, to change it, to modify or improve it, that sort of thing. And then in between these, again on the spectrum, in between these are a category of licenses that are sometimes called weak copyleft licenses. So these are those that are similar to the strong copyleft. There's that same concept of you preserve the rights for downstream recipients from you. The differences here are typically that there are differences in boundaries for how far that copyleft extends. Um, and again, this the, I know I'll, I'll keep saying it depends, varies license by license, but sometimes this will say, this may be something like the file, the specific files that you receive from upstream, those the copyleft left obligations apply to. So you have to continue to make, make available changes that you made to those to those specific files, but you could perhaps use these alongside other source code that or other software that is under a different license that is not under the same weak copyleft license. So differences in the boundaries, but somewhat similar concepts here. And these, the weak, weak copyleft and strong copyleft licenses, you'll sometimes see them called reciprocal licenses. Um, again, with reciprocal being that concept of you received these, these permissions from upstream, you preserve these, these uh, licenses and these freedoms and grants to downstream. So in these categories, there's a bucket, uh, there's kind of buckets of different common examples. And these, these are, I would say, the most common licenses in each of these categories that you'll typically run to in normal, you know, in, in normal practice. You'll find others that are outside these categories, certainly, but these are, the, these are probably the most common. So in the permissive category, we talked about MIT. We talked some about Apache as well. There's also BSD2 clause and BSD, kind of the whole, whole family of BSD licenses. A lot of them have a lot, of, if, you, if you look at all the variants that are out there, a lot of them have nuances or differences, but for the most common ones, they would fall into this category. Um, for weak copyleft, LGPL is one of the most common. There's also Mozilla, Eclipse are, are pretty common. In the Java ecosystem, you'll find a lot of use of the CDDL, the Common Development Distribution License. And then in, in, among the strong copyleft examples, the GPL and then the Faro GPL are going to be the most common. Um, there's a question in the chat, can you define copyleft? And yeah, copyleft is um, what I was saying before about this reciprocal concept of licenses. It's this idea of preserving and, and when the rights that you receive from the upstream source of the software, being obliged to preserve and make it, provide those same rights to downstream users of the software. Um, for the, uh, I see there's a, just, I'm, I'm going to answer one more question. There's another question here about the, the SourceForge platform um, about changing program code structure and selling to others. I don't, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the specifics there, so I don't think that's something I'm going to be able to, to really weigh on, in on here. I'm sorry. So, great. All right. Um, thank you. And then going on, and sorry, just to be clear on that, I'm, I'm not familiar with the specifics there, I, I, so I don't want to kind of weigh in with, uh, with details without, know, without knowing more about it. So 
Um, I see there's another question about how to join the, uh, the Linux Foundation. Um, so the Linux Foundation, so members of the Linux Foundation are typically organizations and companies. So um, there, is, there is an individual sponsorship mechanism that's, that you can find out more about on our website. Um, but that's when it comes to actual membership in the Linux Foundation um, for, for the organizations that are members. Separate from that, any of our open source projects are open to the community to participate in on the technical side. So there are, um, <clears throat> they're fully open. Anyone can come and as long as they're, they're complying with the, the, um, you know, the policies, the, the, me the IP mechanisms, the other things that we'll talk about a little bit more later in, in this, this talk. Um, anyone is welcome to participate in our in our projects in, on the technical side, and so that's something that there are there are mentorships, there are other um, you know other ways kind of on ramps for people to get more involved. And uh, if we have time, we may talk about some of those right at the end. Um, but yeah, there's there are uh, many different profiles of, and many different skills that, skill sets that can be um, that can be used in in contributing to projects. So a lot of open roles and a lot of ways for people to participate. Um, Couple quick other, other comments. Uh, what about zero BSD? Um, so I'd say zero BSD falls in that same permissive category is typically how that would be seen. Um, for MIT, what has to go into the license.txt file in source code root? Um, that is, so again here, I, I don't, I'm not gonna get too much into the details of what specifically you have to put in which file for complying with which license and just partly just because it, it varies so much in different use cases. Cases. But what we will do as we get on is we get to, to managing license information. Um, there, it is something that there are best practices that we recommend, and I'll be I'll be talking about some of those. So I'm going to go on. I'm going to keep going for now. Just want to make sure we get through everything in this. Um, so briefly, there are there are things other than software. I've been talking entirely about software here, but when it comes to open collaboration, there's a lot of different types of content that is contributed and that can be worked on collaboratively in projects. There's documentation, there's other creative written and artistic content, there's open data, um, there's even a growing open hardware space for, hard, for hardware designs. Um, I'm not gonna spend more time on these, but just wanna note for each of these, there's um, some parts of this may be covered by open source licenses, um, particularly around documentation. Some open source licenses will talk about documentation, but there are subsets of licenses separate from open source software, but other open licenses that do focus on each of these different areas. So notably the, the Creative Commons licenses for creative written and artistic content. Um, that's really what they're focused on. And so when you're, when you're looking at what license to apply to what type of content, there are different categories of them out there. So just noting that for, for you to be aware of. And the last thing I'll say on this concept of types of licenses is around kind of a growing use of a term called source available licenses. So this is where, going back to the beginning of what we talked about, not you know, just the fact that source code is available or even that it's worked on collaboratively in, an open pro in a project doesn't necessarily mean that the license that it's available under is a free software license or is an open source license. So those definitions, the free software license, open source license is really meant to tie into the different, the, the, those terms are meant to tie into the specific definitions that OSI and the FSF have put out there. So I think the term that I've heard used and I think is, is useful in this context is source available to be the superset of all of those. So free software and open source licenses are source available because the source code is available. But for other, even for other licenses where they don't necessarily meet all the requirements of that, calling them source available can be a useful way to think about them and still, still understand them while understanding that they don't necessarily give all the same scope of rights that a free software or an open source license would. Okay, so we're gonna, so with that, let's move on. Um, <clears throat> we'll turn to talking about managing license information. So this is, everything up till now has been kind of the substance of what are licenses, what do they do, what do they, you know, from a legal and, and kind of substantive perspective, what do they look like? So now we get into the details of, okay, that's great, but what does that mean for me in practice when I'm working with open source code? And answering this question, this is where it'll come into some of the questions that were raised about scanning tools, things like that. Um, to be able to manage license information, you have to think about what licenses are relevant to a project. So the easiest one here is gonna be just the project's own primary license. So 
look at its license.txt file or look at what it says in the project metadata or wherever it says what its license is. That's kind of the primary license for that project. But different licenses might apply to different aspects of the full use of the project in context. And that's because the you know, technology software is so complex and typically is built on top of so many different dependencies and subdependencies. There's a lot of different, you know, each of those might have a different license that applies to them. Um, those licenses might interact with one another in unexpected ways. So getting your arms around what exactly you, you know, before you answer the substantive question of what are our obligations, you need to know, okay, what's the starting point for which licenses I'm even looking at? And for anything more than the smallest project, this can very quickly become a large number of licenses. So um, the, um, sorry, the typical high level process for what, what an organization would go through when they're thinking about this would look something like this. Every, you know, every organization, every company is gonna have their own different specific steps that they go through, but very broadly, it's gonna look something like this. It's gonna be first figuring out just what software are we even talking about? So which project, which dependencies, which third party other components are involved in the building and use and distribution of, of our software. The second part is, is then saying, okay, that's great. We know which software we're talking about. Now, what are what licenses are, are those pieces of software made available under? Third is then, okay, we know what the software is, what the licenses are, how are we using it? So as, a, as an organization, are we just using it internally? Are we redistributing it? Are we using it in, in various other contexts, like a hosted or a SaaS sort of context? Getting, getting a handle around all of those things. From that, you can then start saying, okay, now that we know all that, how do the licenses apply to our context of use? Are there incompatibilities there? Are there, you know, for instance, are there diff multiple different copyleft licenses that are interacting with one another in a, prop in a way that is problematic, in a way that would say, that would say you have to make, like, make software, for instance, you have to make software available under both of these copyleft licenses at, at the same time in a way that you wouldn't actually be able to comply with. So that would be an incompatibility of those licenses and would need, you need to look at what the impact of that would be. The fifth part is then, the fifth and sixth parts are then really, okay, once we know all of that, once we've addressed all of this, what is it that we have to communicate and provide um, outward downstream to, to recipients of our software for us to continue to be compliant with our responsibilities under the licenses? So what information do we need to provide? If there is source code we need to provide under a copyleft license or if we are, or whether, whether or not it's required, if we're providing source code, how do we make sure that we do that as part of our build and release process? So for the, for the, the next several slides, I'm gonna be focusing really on those two, on steps two and five. So how do we identify the licenses? How do we communicate that information outward? So on identifying the licenses, the challenges here are, um, first off the scale, it's that if we're, you know, if we're talking a very small project that just has one or two dependencies, it might be something you could do manually. If you're getting beyond that and in some, you know, in some programming ecosystems, even the smallest project is going to pull in potentially hundreds of other dependencies, the scale of doing this manually quickly gets out of hand. So the, uh, the difficulty of it as well comes into play. So it's something that um, if all you were talking about was kind of perfectly well-formatted, well-structured data, it might be something that could be easily parsed. But the challenge is that you still find, um, you find license notices expressed in a wide variety of different formats, including in many cases in what basically boils down to natural language. So you're looking at doing natural language parsing or using other techniques to figure out what licenses apply if you're doing it in some sort of automated way. And then last part is it's just not fun. You know, for most people, this is not why they got into uh, to programming. It's not, not why they got into open source to, uh, to be going around and trying to parse a whole bunch of different licenses. And so, um, you know, all of these are, are things that become roadblocks to having this be something, having kind of license identification and, and compliance be something that is automatic and handled regularly. And so, um, so I've touched on a lot of this already. Um, but there are, there are various, one of the key things I would say is that for larger projects, and here I mean both, I'm talking about both open source projects as well as 
um, <clears throat> you know, organizations that are developing internal software or even if they're developing proprietary software that uses open source tools or uses open source components, kind of any, any of this, if you're building something that's more than just a small project, if it's something that's a larger project or product or service, it's gonna be something that managing all these different pieces of data is gonna be something that's hard to do at scale without some sort of automation or tools. Um, there's a variety, of, and fortunately, there's a variety of tools out there that can help with this, and there's ongoing efforts to develop new ones to address new technology areas. So, um, at the end, of, at the end of these slides, there's I'm going to have um, in the resources there's some more specific open source tools that I'll talk about. Um, so I'll come back to this a bit later. Um, but the, uh, <clears throat> the the key thing I would say here is that what's really important is to pick one of them understand what it does and what it doesn't do because certainly you know like anything none of these tools are perfect each one of them is using some different mechanism some different strategy to try to uh, uh, approach a certain piece of this problem and so it's important to pick you know pick one tool start with a tool if you're not using any right now start with one understand the scope of what it does and incorporate it into your development process and then as you work with that understand what it's not doing, look at whether there are additional, whether there are gaps that should be additionally addressed, figure out ways to address that. So kind of like any other sort of software development, I would say look at this as something that is more area for continual improvement rather than, you know, needing to find the one perfect solution that's going to solve everything from, you know, from day one, if this is something that you're not doing already. So I see there's one question in chat I'll, I'll address quickly. It was a question about the, the prior slide where we talked about um, providing source code. Um, does this just apply to your own work or also on dependencies that you use? Um, th again, this is one of those where it, it is gonna largely depend on your specific context and your specific use case. So what are the dependencies you're talking about? Are they something that you're, distri you're distributing or that the user is obtaining themselves? Is the work that you're where you're making use of those dependencies is your work using them in a way such that your work becomes, you know, I'm using air quotes here, but your work becomes a derivative work or becomes a work based on that dependency or something else. Um, those all go, if, you know, if the, if the answer to those questions is yes, then in the case of a copy, it, it, sorry, just realized I'm answering a couple different questions here. If the work, if the answer to those questions is yes, then you're likely going to need to be providing your own source code for your own modifications under a copyleft license. But setting that aside, if you are redistributing even just the unmodified dependencies under an open source license, in many cases, yes, you are going to have some sort of copyleft obligations that apply just with respect, even just with respect to those dependencies themselves. And so that's why it's important to look at what are they, how do we obtain them, how do we track the source code from up, from upstream so that we can meet our own obligations with regards to source code um, beyond just you know beyond just pointing upstream and saying that it's their responsibility to to do that? If we're redistributing those dependencies themselves, we'll need to look at how we, how we are responsible for that as well. Steve, okay. do you mind if I add uh, one or two comments here? Sure, that. go on. So based on my previous experience, I'm speaking as a, a developer and a, uh, de architect type role to see when you are designing a product and you plan to incorporate open source pieces, right? So then the first thing, it, it is beneficial to start with identifying conflicts and looking at overall piece and say, which components, open source components, are, am I planning to incorporate in my product? And then look at all of those and identify ahead of time what conflicts you might run into. So to save time later on, um, it's usually um, counterproductive to develop a bunch of things and start pulling open source components. And then um, right before you are getting ready to release, you, you figure out, no, I can't do this. So. Yeah, great, great points. Really, really great points, Shua. And yeah, that's, I totally agree with that, particularly when it comes to this question of addressing incompatibilities. Um, that's something that the earlier in the development process that you're looking at this, the easier it's going to be to be able to spot an incompatibility and address it before you've taken a hard dependency on it, before it's going to involve going back and rewriting code to rip something out and find an alternative to it. So, yep, great, great points. So. 
Um, okay, so then going on, so this is the, up to this point, I've talked about process for how you manage information. So then getting into some of the technical details of, you know, what would you actually, how do you actually do this? Turning to communicating the license information. So we've got, we've gathered the details about what software we're using. We've gathered this license information. How do we then provide that to downstream users in a way that's going to be effective and useful for them? Um, because part of this is, you know, it's kind of, the, if, you've, if you've heard the phrase, like, leave it better than you found it. If you've gone through this process of figuring out, taking all these steps to figure out upstream, what are all the different licenses involved? If you can, for your own project or for your own product or whatever it is, if you can make that information available in an easy to consume way for your downstream users, it's going to save them the time and effort of having to reproduce all of that when they're figuring out how to use your stuff. So. SPDX is a project that uh, has been at the LF for about, I think about 10 years now, maybe more, um, that is focused on developing an, an open standard for this is what's called software bill of materials information. So you can think of it as an ingredients list or as a, a um, bill of materials, a list of the different components, the licenses, the copyright notices, and kind of as it's expanding, it's, it's coming to encompass other areas of, of interest about the software itself. So, Sec potentially security vulnerabilities in the software as they're identified, other information about the build process, things like that are all part of the direction that SPDX has been heading in its next version that's under development. So, um, as so, and, and should have said here, part of this is that SPDX itself, one, one part of SPDX is focused on developing a the specification for an SPDX document. So the document, the SPDX document is that bill of materials. So it's something that could be, you know, it's basically a, another file with the metadata about the software that you're, you're distributing. And that, that SPDX document would contain the license information, the copyright notices, the security information, any of these other things. So one component of that, one part of an SPDX document, and this, this is something that has seen, uh, I think, quite a bit of use outside just SPDX documents, has been the SPDX license list. So this is a curated list of licenses that um, the, the SPDX legal team, which is an open team, again, open for anyone to come and participate in. Um, this is a, a curated list of, I believe, a, a kind of approaching 500 licenses and exceptions now that have been found in practice, found out in the wild. Um, licenses and license statements that are, are license texts that for each one, it's a, it is, when it's added to the list, it's associated with a particular unique identifier. And the benefit of this becomes now we can just refer to the license just by using that unique identifier. Um, and part of this is that the, the definitions on the license list include templating. So they include the, idea, the understanding that licenses, when they're used in practice, they, don't, they aren't necessarily literally bite for bite every character that you find, that, you know, they don't match bite for bite, even if they're talking about the same license. So a BSD three clause license is a good example. Um, there, there are parts in the license text itself where you'll sometimes find it modified to list the specific copyright holder in the middle of the text rather than just having standard text. And so part of what the, the license, the SPDX license list does is it gives you the ability to, in your own processes, when you're looking at what licenses are we talking about, you can refer to BSD3 clause, just that identifier, and know that it means this corresponding license text, including that template. So the benefit of this, one benefit is that then these license identifiers have gotten uptake and use in a lot of other areas. So there's some, um, I believe some package managers and, and, and ecosystems that will, that may even mandate use of SPDX license identifiers for designating what license applies to their software. Um, but separate from that, what this also does is um, it gives you the ability in your source code to be able to use these identifiers for the same way. So something that we recommend to really all of our projects and that I think we've seen a lot of projects outside the Linux Foundation use as well is to add short form, SPDX short form identifiers to, um, you know, ideally it's to every file in an open source project or every file where it's reasonably possible, you know, for, for certain like image, like uh, graphical image files, things like that, you might not be able to embed it, but for source code or documentation or those sorts of files, adding a, a, an identifier as a comment in this specific format gives a lot of advantages. So having as a comment just at the top of the file, something that says 
this SPDX license identifier in this format, colon, and then the license ID. What that means is a couple things. First off, it means that um, you know, this, whether, you, whether you add this in addition or use this just by itself, it's something that makes, in addition to, uh, you know, sometimes we'll see standard license headers that are 10 or more lines of comments saying, saying in natural language what the license is for a file. The SPDX license identifiers in this format make it so that it's, it's machine readable. So it's now you can parse it just by looking for this specific phrase. And it means that you can now search for it. You can now grep for it um, across a code base and collect all of the licenses that have been, have been designated using this format. So it adds a lot of advantages for making it easier for downstream users to parse and gather license information about your software. If you make it, if when you're providing source code, you include these license identifiers in each file of a project. So, and then the reuse software, um, I've included that here. That's a project from the Free Software Foundation of Europe. It builds on top of this short form identifier concept. So it, it includes that, but it, it, it builds on top of that to also include recommendations about, um, <coughs> about which folders, it kind of how to express the other pieces of license information in your project. So has recommendations around creating a licenses folder at the root level of your directory, how to, like what specific files to put in that, what format to put them in. Again, all of it aiming towards how do we make this information as easy to consume as possible so that there's, so that it minimizes the time that folks have to spend running tools or doing searches or spending manual effort figuring out these answers. How can we make it as automated as possible so that people can, so that it's easier for people to do the right thing when they're complying. So um, let me pause there and just look if there's a, if there's a couple, couple questions. Um, so I see there's a question about, is there effort to make licensing easy, easier in legal terms? Um, so I would say, so a couple things from the technical side, I would say, technically speaking, this is a big part of it, what, what I'm talking about here, um, because it's making it easier to go through the technical process of finding a license, identifying it, that sort of thing. Um, from the, in terms of the license text themselves, there have been, um, there have been a variety of, you know, new licenses are always being written. There's generally, you know, because, license, because a lot of licenses have been, you know, have years or even decades of understanding, kind of community understandings built up around them, there's a general preference for, typically for using existing licenses rather than going out and creating new ones because creating a new one is going to basically cause everybody who's using it to have to sit down, you know, in many cases, talk to their lawyers to understand what exactly it means. Um, so often the, the preference is not to change existing licenses or not to create new ones if the goal is to minimize the effort that's going into, um, going into this. All that being said, sometimes new, new versions of existing licenses or brand new licenses do come out. Sometimes they see uptake from different communities. And in many cases, those new versions or new licenses part of the reason why they might get published is to address what are seen as, you know, what's perceived as issues or complications or lack of clarity in previous licenses. So it is something that over, you know, over time across communities, there is, there is some change in this, but it's kind of that balance between fixing everything to make it help what people might see as perfect versus um, recognizing that there's a lot of value that's built up in what communities have been doing for decades and in the fact that even if new licenses come out, all of this existing software is still under the existing license. So. Steve, there seems to be a, there is a question in the chat and then also in the um, Q and A that might be related. Can a license type change once the project has been created? Can it become less onerous? And there is another one that is uh, after creating a repo how do I choose a license? You might have already answered that, but those two look like a managing license part, so you might wanna, if you wanna tackle them together. Sure, yeah, both, both great questions. So for, for the how to choose a license, um, there's a couple of, you know, variety of different ways. I think if it's something that you're, you're you know, this is your brand new to open source licensing and you're looking for guidance, there's a lot of guidance you can find out there just by searching by going to, you know, particularly that I mentioned the OSI and the, the Free Software Foundation websites. Both of those have quite a bit of information. Um, 
there's other, um, you know, and, and each of them, each of those organizations has different perspectives on what they recommend. So you can get a sense of what they would, what they would advise. Um, I, I believe there's also a couple of other tools that are out there. One of them I'd have, I'd have to look and see. I think the, I think it's called choose a license. The address might be choose a license.com. I would need to look in and make sure, but I, I believe it, it gives you kind of a, a click through series of questions that you can answer kind of yes, no questions to answer to help you focus in on one of one of the handful of most common licenses that get used. So that can be a good starting point for just guidance towards, again, big picture categories, what are the most common licenses that get used. Um, at the Linux Foundation for our projects, we have projects that run the gamut of all the different, you know, essentially all the different most common licenses that are out there. So the Linux, we mentioned before the Linux kernel itself is under GPL2. We have other projects that are under GPL2 with GPL3. We have many that are in the, the, um, the weak copy left category and we have many that are in the permissive license category. So we have, you know, we have project, we work with projects that are under essentially any open, any, any license that is approved by the open source initiative. Um, separately, you know, there are some organizations that require their projects to be under certain specific licenses. And in that case, if you were working with or contributing to a project with one of those organizations, you would look at what their policies are for the licenses that they use. So, and then as far as changing the license type once it's been created, um, I, I'm going to hold on that for just a second. I do want to move on. There's one more section that I want to get to, and it ties in somewhat to that question. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. And if we, if we do have time, I'll touch on that as part of this last bit. So, um, so the, last, the last part for the slides that I had was around contributing to projects. And so everything we've talked up about up till now has really been about when you are using, uh, when you're using software that you're getting, open source software that you're getting from an upstream project, what do you have to do to comply with it? Um, we talked somewhat in the, in the managing license info, we talked somewhat about SPDX and putting SPDX notices in your own files, but from the, the, the legal side and from the licensing side, let's, we'll briefly talk about when you are contributing to yourself to an open source project. And the main thing that I would say here is that depending on the project and depending on its policies, its outbound license might not be the same as its inbound license. So outbound is from the perspective of the project, what do they make their code available? What license do they provide their code under? So typically when you're thinking about what is a project's license, usually you're thinking what is its outbound license? But there's, you know, you can also think about what is its inbound license for the, the people who wrote the code, the individuals the, or the organizations, whoever owns the copyright in the code, when they're contributing it to the project, what is the license that they are providing to the project? Because almost always they're retaining ownership of the copyright in their own contributions, the, th the things that they made. So they themselves are giving a license to the project or maybe to everybody else they're providing a license, and you can think of that as the inbound license. So for a lot of projects, for, and often for smaller projects, um, they may not talk about this at all. They may, you know, a project on, that's on GitHub or, or somebody you know, that's hosted in another place might just say, here's our license, our license is GPL, or our license is MIT, that's it. They might not say anything beyond that. But for, for larger projects where there's more of a focus on thinking about open source licenses and license compliance. They'll often use a more formal contribution mechanism. And the most common ones you'll see will be one or one of these. So they may use the developer's certificate of origin, it's called the DCO, or they may use a contributor license agreement called a CLA. And so for each of these, so first for the DCO, so the, the developer's certificate of origin is one text, there's kind of one DCO text and it's used across many different projects. So you can see the text at, <coughs> at developercertificate.org. Um, it's very short. It's about, you know, there's basically four sections to it. Um, and this is something that, that grew out of the Linux kernel community. So in the mid 2000s, in response to the, the SCO lawsuits at the time, and um, what, the, what, what developed out of the, the technical folks in the Linux kernel community was um, this process. And so it's a process where if you look at the developer, the DCO text, there's a few different sections that are basically boiled, they, you, know, you should look at the specifics, but they boil down to an assertion that the contributor, so the person contributing code, 
say an assertion that they have the right to contribute the code that they're offering under the license that's specified in the file. So at the time that they're making the contribution to the project, at the time that they make the contribution, they include this assertion that yes, I have the right to contribute this to the project. And the, the mechanism by which they make that assertion is via a sign off in the, the commit message. So, and it looks like the example that I've got here. So signed off by colon, and then the person's name and email address. And the reason for doing this is really that it, it, it builds on, partly it builds on top of that, that community of trust and the, the importance of tr trust that was core to the, the Linux kernel community developing the way that it did. Um, but the idea that the, per, the, the person who's showing up and is contributing code, that, that in order to contribute it and before it'll be brought in, they need to make the assertion that yes, I've done the work I should do to be able to say, I have the right to contribute this and to contribute it under the license that's specified in the file. So, yeah. Steve, um, if we are getting yes. very close, about probably uh, six, seven, okay. six minutes left, so. Um, okay, so great, thank you. So I, I will go ahead and, and speed through the last part of this then. Um, so that's the DCO process. It's, it's often seen as being fairly lightweight because it's just this one, this one statement that's added to a commit message when the contribution is made. <coughs> so then the other, the other common mechanism would be a contributor license agreement. So a CLA, this is a, an actual legal agreement. So it's actually a, you know, an agreement that is signed by individuals or by employers, by organizations before someone can contribute to a project. So this would be a CLA is typically signed one time for each person or each organization um, before they contribute. There's, a, the, there's a, a lot of different CLA texts out there. So on, unlike the DCO, each CLA can say something different. And that means that it is important to read the CLA text and to discuss it with your lawyer to understand what its impact is before you contribute, before you sign it, before you contribute to it. And because it is a, an agreement, if you're contributing on behalf of your employer, you may need to work with your, your legal counsel or your, your supervisor to figure out who within your company has the, author the legal authority to be able to sign a CLA. So, um, so quickly going to the questions, the, the reason I wanted to mention this was because around the, the question about can a license type change once the project has been created? So, some, so for projects that use a CLA, for in some cases, depending, again, depends entirely on the text of the CLA, but in some cases, the CLA, the inbound license is very broad and the inbound license might be broad enough that it gives the, the project the ability to change to, on its own, the project community to decide to change its outbound license from one thing to another. Um, they typically, that's not something that a project would want to do lightly because changing its license is essentially changing the terms on which everybody, everybody downstream is making use of the, of the code. But if a project uses a CLA and the CLA provides a license, an inbound license that's broad enough and every contributor has, or every copyright owner has signed that CLA, then in that case, they might be able to change it. If those things aren't the case, then the other way that a project might be able to change its license would again, would be if they go and get consents from all of the copyright holders of the, of the project code. And whether or not, and how those consents are tracked and whether or not that's even going to be feasible really depends on the project and its current stage of development. So a project that only has a couple of contributors, that might be something where it's easy for them to change the license because they can easily get approvals from everyone. Something where there's hundreds or thousands of contributors and a lot of them are out of contact, that might be an, an extremely you know, onerous task to go through and gather all of, those, all of those consents or to remove parts of the software from people who can't be contacted. So, um, so projects do change their licenses sometime. It is a typically a very, can be a very uh, heavyweight task to go through to be able to do it. Um, all right, so then with that, that goes, I, I know we've uh, been answering questions all along, but we're getting, uh, we only have a couple minutes left. I will very briefly say, um, I'm not gonna spend time on these here, but for resources at the end of the slide. So the slides will be available for download. Um, they, <clears throat> we do include links to a number of, there's, they, do you wanna say there's a free training course on the Linux Foundation training website where we, uh, where, that's specifically about open source licensing basics, goes into everything I've talked about here in more detail. 
We have a number of blog posts and papers that we publish that include more recommendations about specific topics. Um, there's several projects that the, the Linux Foundation sponsors and supports that tackle different aspects of license compliance, ranging from open chain for processes, SPDX we already talked about, to do group talk is a forum for collaboration on best practices and processes also. And then at automating compliance tooling is supports the actual development of open source tools to do compliance work. So scanner tools, that sort of thing. And I've listed a few of those here. Fossology, open source review toolkit, and turn are all within ACT. Scan code was also mentioned earlier on this call. That's not part of ACT, but it's another tool that you'll find out there. All of these are, attack different aspects of the process of addressing open source, of finding open source licenses in your code, managing the process of compliance. Um, so we've got just a, just a couple minutes left for, um, do, well, Shua um, and Megan, do we have time to answer just another question or two, or do, are we at wrap up? Um, if you wanted to answer one, one or two more questions, that would be, that would be good. Yeah, just wrapping up in the next uh, three or five minutes here. Okay, sure. Um, so there's a question, let's see, I see in the Q&A, there's a question about, um, the comment about different inbound versus outbound licenses. So uh, the question being, could we, could we have GPL incoming and BSD3 clause outgoing? So with that as a specific example, that's typically not going to be possible because GPL, if, if the inbound license is GPL, um, then the, the project, you know, they're receiving contributions from the copyright owners under GPL. For the project to comply with those, license, with those contributions, they would need to be, be making their, their, you know, the project code available also under GPL. So typically, you wouldn't be able to take, receive something under a copyleft license and distribute it under a permissive license. I think typically in a lot of cases, you'll hear projects refer to inbound equals outbound. And in many cases, that's what the DCO is, is generally seen as doing, is seen as establishing that sort of inbound equals outbound structure, even though the DCO itself is not a license. It's that assertion that I am, you know, I have the right to make the, make the soft, make my contribution available under the license in the file is seen as kind of preserving that inbound equals outbound equivalent. The main thing where, you'll see, where you might see a different inbound license from an outbound one, the main time you'll see that being difference is where the inbound license is a CLA. So where the inbound license isn't an open source license, but it you know, isn't a standard open source license, but it's a CLA that is signed and that has specific license terms in it. So there the inbound license would be the CLA and the outbound license would be the project's open source license. So now all that said, just real quick on that too, you asked also about going from less, going from more to less permissive. Um, so that is, so if you flipped it around, if you if the project were to receive something under BSD3 clause, typically they can, they would then be able to distribute that, that software under something like GPL. The main thing is they would still need to, to, you know, so if they take a BSD3 work, incorporate it into something else that is GPL and then distribute the, the combination, Typically, that would be seen as the combination is under GPL, and it's okay to distribute that. The project would still need to preserve the BSD3 uh, license notices, though, with respect to that particular uh, the, that particular uh, contribution. But those two, the BSD3 and GPL, would not be incompatible if they are distributed under the GPL together. Okay, and I see we're I see we're at time, so. Um, I guess any, uh, Shua or Megan, any last uh, wrap up? Yes, thank you so much, Steve. And thank you to everybody who participated. Lots of really great questions um, in interaction. And just to reiterate, um, as Steve mentioned, um, he is uh, going to make the slides available to us. And then this recording will also be on YouTube later today. Um, and both of those will be shared on the Linux Foundation webinars webpage. Um, so you'll have those resources available to you. Um, and we hope you'll join us for a future mentorship session. And um, that is all. Have a, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate the questions. And thanks for uh, joining today.